Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bert Dicht. I am the Managing Director of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, welcome to our Space Forum for this evening. And this is an extra special one. We've got the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, SEDS as they are called, and it's a, com a conversation with several of their SEDS USA leadership. So we're looking forward to a great discussion. There is one thing in terms of the timing, because our guests are at their Space Vision Conference, we can only go to 10 o'clock Eastern time tonight because they've got a lot of things they're doing there. So we'll be ending exactly at 10 Eastern and uh, just to let you know in advance. So we're gonna try to cover as much as we can. So as always, again, I say thank you for joining our series of space forums and town halls. I want to just go over the agenda. We'll cover some virtual etiquette. I've got a couple of NSS announcements and a little bit about what's coming up next. We actually have a longer range calendar with space forums coming up, and then we're gonna get right into our program. So starting with our virtual etiquette, uh, if you do want to submit a question, uh, I encourage you to use the Q&A function. It's seen by the panelists directly. It doesn't get mixed up with all the other chat uh, that we put into the chat function but you are very welcome to use the chat function. I uh, only ask that we, you be respectful of the panelists and the audience because typically everyone can see those questions uh, as they come in. We did get a few questions that were submitted uh, by those who registered beforehand. So we'll try to cover some of those uh, as well if they're not answered in the presentation for tonight. So, so look forward to that. Uh, as always, feel free to give to our cause. We encourage it. If you're enjoying programming like this, like these space forums and town halls, we encourage you to donate to support NSS. We appreciate your membership. We appreciate your past support. Uh, I will be putting the link into the chat. So again, thank you in advance uh, for any donations. Also at the end, please complete the post space forum survey. It only takes a few minutes. Uh, and it'll pop up once you exit, it's anonymous, and it really does help us in terms of planning future events. Uh, and the schedule coming up, we've got the schedule now firmed up through the end of February. Uh, once we get into the new year, we'll get back to doing uh, two a month. And coming up next is on the 8th of December. It's our annual year in review. Uh, with Larry Boyle and moderated by Jim Plaxco. Uh, a lot of things happened this year in space, so I know it's going to be a really fun uh, and informative session. Uh, coming up on the 12th, uh, once we get into the new year, we have a feature presentation by the Space Ambassadors, uh, and Jim is going to be coming back. We've got a number of other Space Ambassadors who are going to be giving us a kind of a round robin uh, look at the different ways for us to get into low Earth orbit, uh, both from a company standpoint and a launcher standpoint and so on. So we've got five speakers coming up. I'm going to be moderating, and that's going to be very, very interesting. On the 26th of January, we have Christina Corp from the Space for a Better World. Uh, Christina has worked with many astronauts over the years, including Buzz Aldrin. She's got an organization called Space for a Better World, which talks about how we influence our young people and get them working uh, to show that space is a way to make the world a better place. On the 9th of February, we've got Bill Bradshaw coming back. Bill actually spoke a couple of years ago on, uh, on different uh, space station concepts uh, in popular culture. Uh, so he's gonna be doing a talk called 200 Years of Space Tourism, how people have always envisioned and dreamed of going to space. So I think you're going to enjoy that. And on February 23rd, uh, we have the uh, contest winner from our NSS space, space Health Contest, which is called a Healthy Space. And Dr. Maria Kuman is gonna be presenting her paper uh, as part of that presentation on that evening. So a lot of great things coming up. We're really going to try to work to make sure we've got a schedule that's at least a month in advance 
so you can better plan out uh, your participation. So with that, uh, it, I'm, it's my pleasure now to get into our, our program. Oh, I will say this again, if you have any suggestions uh, for speakers or topics, uh, let myself or Larry know, we'd appreciate that. So now let's get into the program for this evening. And we've got three members of the SEDS leadership here. And let me tell you, I've been doing uh, STEM outreach. Uh, I've done a lot with my jobs at IEEE and ASME, meeting the young people who are gonna be inheriting this profession. And I can tell you, these are three very, very impressive students. Uh, and I can tell you too, that the, uh, the space program, the future of space is gonna be in good hands with them. So first, let me introduce uh, our chair of SEDS USA, Sarah Alvarado. Uh, Sarah is gonna be graduating this December with a master's degree in industrial engineering from the University of Central Florida. Uh, she received a BS in industrial engineering from UCF uh, in 2019, and also a BA in economics from the University of South Florida in 2016. She's currently employed as an industrial engineer at Universal, Universal Orlando Resort. So welcome, Sarah. Uh, Audrey Scott serves as the vice chair of SEDS USA. Uh, she is a third year University of Chicago student and she's pursuing a BS in astrophysics and uh, a BA in anthropology as well. She has more than 11 years of diverse work and volunteer experience uh, in entertainment to engineering. And she is the Brooke Owens fellow for the class of 2022 and is now working as a systems engineering intern at Ball Aerospace. Uh, our, our final panelist is uh, Dominic Tanzillo. Uh, he is the SEDS USA chapter expansion manager. Now, Dominic is a first year medical student at Duke University, uh, and he is with a special interest in bioastronautics. Uh, Dominic was a double major at Duke, receiving a mathematics BS and also a neurosciences BS in 2021. Uh, as a student, Dominic uh, conducted research at NASA, uh, the Air Force, the US Space Force, and uh, a really interesting background, uh, all three of our great speakers and panelists tonight. So with that, it's my pleasure uh, to turn things over to Sarah. And then Sarah, Audrey, and Dominic, welcome. We're looking forward to a great conversation tonight. Thank you so much for that introduction. I did want to add that another member of our leadership is here. That's Sunny. He's our DEI leader. Uh, Sunny, did you want to introduce yourself quickly? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, one, it's really great to, to be joining you all tonight. I'm Sunny Narayan, and I'm a research faculty at Florida State University. I have the honor to serve as uh, says USA's chair on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Sunny. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we're really excited. Um, we have a lot in store for you guys. I'll go ahead and get started. Oh. Yep. Okay, go. perfect. <laughs> okay, so we're students for the exploration and development of space. There we go. So we actually started back in the 80s with Peter Diamandis, Scott Schwarfman, Rick, Sor Rick Sorkin, and a few others that later went on to create ISU and XPRIZE, which I know you're all familiar with. Our first conference was held in 1982. Um, there's some of the old pictures from back then. And now we've um, moved on to Space Vision, which we host yearly and which we're at shooting from live right now. SEDS is a fundamentally a university chapter sort of organization. Those first chapters in 1980 were founded at MIT and Princeton and other universities before we were able to go national. So all of our roots are in grassroots space awareness. Okay, so this is us now. First, we have a new logo. And second, <laughs> we've now become an official nonprofit uh, we have about 100 chapters. We're in almost all over half of the United States. This year, earlier, we participated at ISCC. And actually, next year, we will have a stronger SETS presence by bringing some of our diversity students over. Okay, and then on to our projects. We are involved in all sorts of things. I think all of us can talk to some of the things that we're involved in. Uh, myself as being a finance and industrial engineer, I've been more in the in the 
finance and fiduciary part of space, but we have students developing uh, regolith, doing research. Do you want to talk about some of the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, sure. So a lot of the work that, uh, and hi, I'm in the dark back here. <laughs> um, part of the work that Duke does especially, um, and I'm quite proud of it, is basically on the topics of space medicine, uh, a very niche field initially, but kind of encouraging students to look in and explore what that means. For example, that regolith that was just mentioned there, um, we can run uh, basically treat it as lunar or even Martian samples and then see what biological life can grow in it, be that plants, be that fungi, be that some other bacteria, and to really assess the viability of farming or other agricultural products on um, non-Earth bodies. Do you want to talk about some of the stuff you're involved in? Yeah, so for me, I am, as a astrophysics student, I'm a lot more on the scientific research side of this. One thing that does particularly interest me and a lot of other members of our SEDS chapter is alternative propulsion methods that are linked to fundamental physics. And uh, rocketry is a bit more of what my chapter does at the moment, but we are seeking to expand further into things like instrumentation, really connecting with the strong astrophysical legacy that my university has. Has. And then from the anthropology side of things, I'm incredibly fascinated by the human presence in space. And it's that same interdisciplinary focus that we've been able to bring a lot more of in recent years with SEDS. Yeah, and I think a great part of us being students is that we remember what it was like to be in high school and middle school. A lot of our chapters do a lot of involvement with the community. I have a picture there on the screen, and you're going to see more of that at IACC next year. Okay, and you know, before we move on, I did want to highlight our MSI initiative. Our goal for this is to create diverse partnerships and expand our member base in a diverse, uh, equitable, and mindful way so that when we fuel that pipeline into the next era of space, we're doing it in a way that allows for space to grow in all the different sectors. Some of the things that we've done so far this year is bringing on um, a lot of funding for diversity, minority serving institutions, underrepresented backgrounds. You see some of those in those pictures here uh, of our students that attended satellite and new space. We've also been working with companies outside of what you would usually consider a space company, like Field and Bethesda that uh, are video game developers and are sponsoring 22 minority serving institution students here at Space Vision. And this is just the beginning. We're very excited about you know, where we're gonna go next. But I think a great person who can really talk about this is Sunny. Sunny, do you have something to add? Certainly, and uh, to add on what uh, Sarah has really uh, eloquently put, uh, myself being a first generation academic uh, from undergrads and back on STEM, um, space is, been a industry that had always inspired me uh, and really provided me a lot of uh, fantastic um, professional development opportunities, a way to apply myself and contribute to something that uh, I think is just absolutely spectacular, incredibly cool, and it's also inherently uh, international, intercultural, with uh, the International Space Station being a, a symbol of that. Um, and uh, really with that, uh, it's, uh, I think, um, really a wonderful uh, initiative that says has uh, really led in the context of the aerospace industry to reach out to um, uh, and broaden uh, the awareness of the space industry with uh, more communities and to highlight that space is I think a great example of industry that is um, inclusive and uh, 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 really uh, requires uh, uh, the experience and backgrounds and perspectives of, uh, of, of everyone um, as uh, Sarah uh, and Audrey and uh, Dominic had highlighted a few examples of different um, uh, areas within space, space medicine, finance, uh, astrophysics. Uh, it's inherently interdisciplinary. And um, having a broader scope of uh, students uh, from um, universities uh, uh, it, it adds to and uh, contributes to that um, inherent uh, quality to the space industry. So it's been really uh, exciting and a lot of um, uh, wonderful spirit uh, uh, that the uh, SEDS has in reaching out to um, MSI uh, universities and really inspiring these students that uh, one may ha may ha not be aware of what the space industry does, what uh, how to get involved in the space industry, um, and uh, learn about 
ways how they can get involved and, and learn and contribute in really meaningful ways at, um, at the high school and uh, collegiate level. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay, perfect. So I did want to mention some of the people that you might have heard of that are past SETS members. Jeff Bezos was president of his Princeton chapter. He's also been a very active donor for SETS. He's helped us achieve, I think, a lot and entering into what I call the new golden era for SETS has been through some of his funding and, and donations. We also have Will Pomerantz, who is on our board of advisors. And after that is a few of our alumni who have gone and created their own companies because through SETS, they were able to understand the industry and see where there is opportunity in the market. Oh, did you? There we go. Okay. <laughs> so where will we where will we be in the future? Definitely from, from what you're already seeing in leadership, we're all about diversity and bringing that to space. I mean, it's, it's so integral to answering those questions that we probably haven't even asked yet. Um, so we're really focusing on the, that MSI initiative and representation wherever we go, wherever we take our students, we wanna make sure that it's something that is useful from a holistic approach. And um, from there, we're definitely partnering with more interesting organizations. I mentioned our partnership with NSS, uh, but the team that we're bringing, the student team that we're bringing to ISTC is actually gonna be comprised of SETS members, NSBE members, SWE and SHIP. So you're gonna have a very diverse demographic of students and they're actually all working together to build a CubeSat with the mission of space sustainability. So we're able to bring this science and space to uh, organizations that might not particularly have that experience. And I think that's the most important part is that we can turn back and, and pull on the others. One of the other main things with these interdisciplinary partnerships as well is exploring avenues of opportunity and connection that might not have been considered because it's not a traditional aerospace sort of path. This does bring me up a lot with thinking about our partnership with Bethesda, which is something that is shaping up to be a longer term commitment to one another. Bethesda is a video game company. They are not software engineering for satellites, they're not building these different types of rockets or anything like that, but they have a role in this connection with space and in this connection with STEM. And we've been able to explore fantastic opportunities because of that partnership. So with this new era, which as Sarah calls the golden age of SEDS, what I like to consider the post-club future donation <laughs> era, we are really thinking about exploring all of these different sectors and uh, aspects that can create a more intellectually fruitful industry. And from my role as the expansion guy, a lot of the fun comes from bringing different groups together, right? And so we say we're doing outreach and bringing folks from different backgrounds together. And that also means that we get mixtures of ideas and ways that are playing back and forth in ways that we might not consider. So that could be including like how healthcare interfaces with a more diverse crew of astronauts, right? And so now we need the intersection of both, you know, identity and then also medicine and how these two factors play back and forth. And if there's a role of, you know, specialized medicine or if there's, you know, maybe that that is not a place necessarily for the space medicine frontier. And that's only really possible when we bring folks with different backgrounds, different interests and really different life experiences together in, you know, forums like where we're all right now is just Space Vision, our annual conference, just so many fun, exciting people bouncing ideas off each other. That's really the generative force that I love to see and, and hope that, you know, our work at SEDS is affecting in the aerospace industry. Ultimately, progress accelerates when genius is multiplied, and that's a part of the <laughs> SEDS mission, whether uh, no matter what sort of background someone may have, what sort of background in aerospace they may have, it is bringing on people who may have otherwise not been given a chance. It's bringing on those who maybe were thinking about another industry, but aerospace ends up being their home. This is how we make change. And that's a large part of our mission with personal and professional and technical development that encourages a new industry. Well said. <laughs> 
Okay, so what we want to finish on is the impact that we bring. Obviously, as a nonprofit, we are our, our main focus is that social impact, making sure that we improve society in some way. So I mentioned the outreach to our communities, but what you see is us becoming that pipeline into the industry um, that will expand and, and grow space for, for years to come. We're really excited about what the partnership with NSS will be. Uh, we think that NSS is also a great way that SETS members can, can help and improve space in the industry as a whole. Um, and we're really glad that you have us on here. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much for that great introduction to SEDS, what you're doing and where you're going with the organization. I do have some questions that were submitted uh, beforehand. So I'd like to ask those and it looks like some have come in as well. So this one is to everybody, including, uh, including Sunny. Uh, what got you interested in space and space exploration and development? Whoever would like to go first. I'm happy to start. The question is, how much time do I have to answer? Because there's, there's a, a lot of stories there. Um, for me, it's kind of um, maybe a little bit different than a lot of folks where I was not an astronaut kid. Instead, I was much more of a dinosaur kid. And I think that's where my love of biology and medicine eventually came from. But in working as an EMT, working with Duke Life Flight, which is a helicopter transport agency, I really love talking through the, the basically how the medication and transit management changes as you ascend in the atmosphere, pressure drops, temperature drops, oxygenation levels go away. And you know, it kind of really changes the way that we think about, oh, treating a critically ill patient. And so that got, then got me thinking of like, okay, can we take this even further extreme? And of course, you know, if you just keep going higher and higher in the atmosphere, eventually, eventually, depend and depending what line you draw it at, but you know, you'll reach space at some point. Um, and so that was kind of the, the avenue that started it. And it tied in nicely that my grandfather was a, basically a self-taught engineer who had worked for the Apollo program. So I was kind of finding my way to tap into both that legacy, but then also make it my own with the medicine, medical side of things. So I applied, got a NASA internship, and now the rest is history. Nice. For Great. me, I always liked space, but I didn't think that my interest financed money would ever align to that. And it wasn't until my first SEDS meeting at my university where I sat down next to a history major and we just talked about space. And that's when I knew, oh, I don't have to build a rocket to, to be in space. This is crazy. And SEDS at National has really propelled my networking and my understanding of what the industry has to offer. So, yeah. Well, I think my journey with SEDS was a bit more along the line of Sarah's probably. Mm -hmm. I was inducted into my local SEDS community through a science fiction writing forum. And um, so basically the president of the chapter had said, hey, you like this and you like talking, come be our social chair. So I said, sure. First. Sounds awesome to me. Um, so I organized things like watch parties before I ultimately um, became the VP of my local and then joined SEDS National at last Space Vision. But for me, I think what SEDS really was, was a reintroduction to aerospace. It was something that I had always had an inkling of interest in growing up in Houston. My first ever job was a commercial for Space Center Houston in of itself. And once I got to high school and I'd left my prior career in the entertainment industry for the most part, I had a really big fascination with aerospace that fizzled when I saw how rigid the curriculum could be at so many schools and institutions. It's one of the reasons why I opted to study astrophysics because I was able to have more intellectual freedom with what I opted for. And sense was sort of like, like aerospace coming back and calling me up and saying, hey, how are you doing? You should catch up sometime. And it was a part of that being a part of this community that encouraged me to apply for the Brooke Owens Fellowship. Um, and then when I was interviewed as a semifinalist, it was by a SEDS member as well. So um, really SEDS is community and SEDS is impact in that form. And it's something that I'll always be grateful for. Great, great stories. Uh, Sunny, how about you? 
certainly for me it is uh twofold stories and um inspiration uh let me begin with stories i uh grew up in Morgantown, west virginia and in west virginia uh, uh i grew up uh, uh, uh listening and hearing about um individuals like Homer Hickam and, and Chuck Yeager and Katherine Johnson and uh, all these ties to the space industry. Um, and I also grew up at a time when the um, uh, International Space Station was being, was an idea, uh, was then being designed, was then being developed, and then being launched. And uh, just the concept of, of, of this station in space as a, as a, as a kid just, uh, just blew my mind uh, that, um, uh, that there was a, 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 that there were projects that that did these sort of things, um, and I had a, and I had an interest in science. I had an interest in engineering, but I wasn't sure exactly what uh, uh, what direction I wish to take. But then it was a combination of just this uh, incredible um, project that was ongoing, and then hearing these stories of individuals tied that uh, uh, Catherine Johnson grew up uh, where I grew up, and that connection uh, inspired me to think, wow, I could maybe be a part of uh, something like that too. And um, a long story short, I've uh, been really privileged in that regard and uh, uh, to be involved with NASA in the way I have been. Very good. It's interesting of all the different paths that we come from, but we all end up on that same path about, uh, about space. I, I, I love it. Uh, so let me get to a, a few other questions. How can a student uh, join SEDS if they're interested? That would be, um, yeah, that, that's the perfect, I'm the perfect guy for that. Um, so there's a form on the seds.org website. Um, and if you go to start a chapter, basically it will, um, you'll fill out the form and then I will get that form and then I'll send some emails and we'll just pass it back and forth. I'll send you a checklist of steps to take. And then once that's all done, you're basically ready to join SEDS. It's a fairly simple process, and I think I've streamlined it, but um, we'll throw the link in the chat. Yeah, put the, the link in the chat. That'd be great. Yeah. Yep. So that's if you're a student. Yes. If you're not a student, then a great way to get involved with SEDS is at Space Vision. You can come and meet all of our, well, a majority of, of our chapters. You can also get involved by going to our website on the chapter list. You can find chapters near you, potentially chapters in the institution that you went to and give back to them or become a, a mentor or an advisor for their projects. So there's definitely a lot of avenues no matter where you're at. Great. Now, I want to touch on something you had mentioned, Sarah, about uh, uh, all you know diversity and there's you know, diversity from a people standpoint, obviously, but culture and so on. But there's also diversity in terms of what you're studying. And the question has to do is, are said students science and engineering majors, or can they join if let's say they're a business major? So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm an economics and industrial engineering major. So absolutely. And the great thing is, if you are in a school that is, let's say, very into policy, then your chapter is independent in the way that they can create their own curriculum and decide what projects and what they're going to invest their time into. So an example of this is um, Georgetown. Yeah, Georgetown was the school that we took to ISDC. One of, their, one of their representatives, we took to ISDC this year and they presented on the policy initiatives that they've taken um, and, and the things that they've made happen through their institution. So it's great that you can kind of manipulate sets to, to meet the things that you're trying to get out of it. That's great, absolutely. Uh, I do wanna to point to a comment that's in the, on the chat from James about uh, uh, the space law students at the University of Mississippi and actually uh, our president, Michelle Hanlon, who, uh, uh, who does so much with, uh, with space law. But I was at a conference uh, recently for the IEEE uh, Ada Kappa Nu, that's uh, uh, Students in Electrical and Computer Engineering, their honor society. And I was with a bunch of students at dinner and asking them what they're planning to do when they graduate. And one mentioned that she was going to be going to law school. And uh, I said, oh, what did you what did you want to do uh, with that? And she said, oh, I, you know, patent law, you know, that type of thing. And I just happened to say, had you ever thought about space law? 
And she said, I, I don't even know what that is. And we started talking about it. And she said, wow, that does sound quite interesting. So I don't know if I got a convert there, but uh, it, it just shows that there, there's so many different paths uh, to getting involved in, in space. So fabulous. Uh, I mean, Space Vision this year is being hosted by a university that does not have a mechanical engineering major. And I can't say no engineering majors because we have molecular engineering, but that's, no, its, that's its own okay. beast. And we're very grateful for their support as well. Um, but ultimately, what we're able to do in so many of these environments is bringing together all of these fields. Even one of our speakers is a space law guy who's worked with the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. So it's really fantastic, especially with the new efforts in the recent years of SEDS to be able to bring all of those different aspects to the forefront. Oh yeah, space law is huge, especially because of how fast the industry is growing. But I've also met a few, a few law students that are interested in, in studying space. And one of them said to me that it's hard for them to find other people in their community, even uh, older, um, lawyers and, and policy specialists that understand that they're usually like, oh, like aliens. And that's definitely not what space law and policy does. And if you- Maybe someday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. So very yeah, good. thank you for that comfort. That yeah, works. yeah, very good. Uh, let's get a couple other questions and then I'll go to some that have been uh, submitted live tonight. Uh, how did being in SEDS impact your internships? Uh, interesting question. Who would like to take that first? Uh, I'm happy to lead. In fact, my um, school SEDS chapter started after I started an internship where I met one of our, um, pan on our board members, um, Chris Lanehart, and he um, is a space med guy. And he was telling me about SEDS of this really great student organization. So I actually brought it back from my NASA internship back to my university. But from there, I used the uh, organization to connect a lot of students to more NASA internships or other industry connections, basically using SEDS as this nice hub to launch people to whatever you know their goals were. So kind of, I, I started it, but then helped you know, segue people in it. And it was a really good place to hand off knowledge from one person to the next. Because when I first got to NASA, I just had no idea really what, you know, the, the work would entail. Um, my school doesn't do a lot of co-oping. And so that was a really good place to like pass that information from person to person. Great. Anybody else? I think I said most of what I would say with that question earlier regarding the Brooke Owens Fellowship, given that that as a junior, I've had two summers available to me for internships, and one of them I spent in intensive language study instead. So uh, that's been my path with SEDS and how it's affected my internship uh, opportunities, and I'm really grateful for it. Great. Uh, I did have a question that came from a 10th uh, grade student from India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if it's uh, male or female. Their dream is to become an astrophysicist. So Audrey, there you go. Uh, so they want to know what advice do you have for them? Uh, join the SEDS India. They <laughs> okay. are driving, especially in, in high schoolers. Yeah. You guys have something else to add? Well, maybe you have advice for uh, budding astrophysicists. Yeah, definitely. So I think... Astrophysics is a wide field, and it's really intimidating at first if you just pick up a textbook and think, okay, this is what I'm looking at. I'm seeing all of these different things, and then your brain scrambles up and you explode. Um, so think about one thing that really interests you. Maybe you want to think about how stars form or how galaxies form, or like we were just hearing today at our opening keynote speech, maybe about those first seconds of the universe or thinking about all of those different aspects of particle physics. So it's great to have this wide view, but you've got to narrow it down. And one way that you can do that is try to reach out to faculty and students at your local universities, see what it's like in your community. I mean, I know for me, I've, there have been plenty of times where I've sent an email to someone saying, and usually for academics, emails are freely available online, which is amazing. Um, but I've sent emails saying, hey, I'm really interested in this topic. Do you have time to hop on a quick Zoom call so we can discuss it? And that's been a really great way to meet members of my community at my university and also learn more things about various different aspects of the field. So that's the big thing. And 
Some people describe uh, astrophysics as math with glow in the dark star stickers stuck on it. So I, I think I found that to be pretty true. So definitely make sure that you keep up your studies and your math courses. And don't forget how important it is to also write and to stay grounded and philosophical about your place in the universe. I think that makes it all the more enjoyable. Yeah, as, as Teddy Roosevelt said, keep your eyes on the stars, but your feet firmly on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're a historian too, uh, Dominic, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I dabble. Uh, <laughs> very good. Guy, if you want to talk about Julius Caesar, let me know. Really? No problem. Okay. You're all Renaissance types. Very good. <laughs> Uh, so let me take some questions that came in and then we'll get a few more. And then uh, uh, the students had asked me to make a short presentation on National Space Society. So we'll make sure we can get all of that in. I've got two questions from Carl uh, related to, uh, to met space medicine in, in effect. So I'll start with those. Uh, regarding space medicine, is there any more information concerning the effects of spa the space environment on our DNA? Um, well, absolutely. There's a really, really great paper called the NASA Twin Study. In it, um, one of my friends actually at um, Wall Cornell basically examined an astronaut that was left here on Earth and an astronaut here on space. And, and let me just say, both men had been to space before. So that's how we established that, you know, we had an astronaut on Earth. Um, but that is to say, they were able to measure their body markers, their biomarkers, which includes metabolic markers or DNA markers among them and look at see what happens over the course of a year in space versus a control subject on Earth. And the really, really exciting bit was that we had some um, DNA modifications, including histone um, and some other kind of like, um, you know, euchromatin becoming heterochromatin or vice versa. But the really, really exciting thing was that the telomeres at the ends of the DNA actually grew longer for the participant in space. And, and that's really fascinating because telomeres are the ends, the telos of your DNA, which is where um, basically they provide the limit on how many times a cell can replicate. And what we actually found is that the cells in space had longer telomeres. And there's a couple different causal explanations why. Potentially, it could be from the higher radiation in space. It could be in changes of diet, fluid shifts, or metabolism. And that's really an open question. But we do know that fundamentally DNA does change in a, in a very real and um, important way when people go to space. So that's the, the quick answer there. But if you want to ask those questions, of course, um, you know, we, we always need more bio, you know, astrobiologists, I should say. That's kind of the, the flip side of, you know, people in space. We also have just organisms and DNA and everything in space. And that's the whole field of astrobiology. So happy to talk more about that later. I'll also add that um, I, I saw Bert in the in the introduction. You're going to have Dr. Farsadaki talk in I think January or February. She is a great expert in human um, development in space and the limited research that's been done on that. She's actually speaking here tomorrow and she's giving a panel just on that. So more to come to answer your question. Please. And I see there was also a comment from one of our members, Rich Howard, about uh, the studies between Mark and Scott Kelly. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so, so that, yeah, was so good. yeah, that was exactly the NASA Twitty, um, and you know the the, and it's just really fantastic work where there's just you know a host of information, a wealth of information to look into. And what's really exciting now is we're actually doing any commercial program. We're basically replicating that study and doing biobanks and you know even assays of DNA in space. And so that that pool of like resources to study is only growing. And accordingly, that's really exciting for anyone looking to get into that field. And I think there was a follow up question from Carl. He's had a few that were in here. Uh, any research being considered involving the use of medication uh, for hibernation for extended space flights? Okay, so this is a really, really exciting because Chris Mason, the author of um, that NASA twin study, wrote a really exciting book. And, and maybe a small self plug, but we talk about said book on my podcast. Uh, the podcast is called Spherical Cows, and Chris Mason was our first guest there. 
And what was really exciting is we talk about this idea of hibernation for basically a long-term space mission, because wouldn't it really be easy if we didn't have to pack so much food and we can just put someone to sleep and then you wake up and you're on Mars. In fact, lots of, lots of movies, um, you know, like sci-fi movies actually, you know, premise that. Um, currently, hibernation is a really, really tough subject to talk about people here on Earth, let alone in space. And so there's a lot more work that would need to be done. But it is something that has been floated and would hopefully be maybe a mechanism to get people to do, you know, uh, one of those ultra distant um, flights, you know, if we're going light years, um, you know, maybe you could have someone, you know, freeze themselves and wake up many, many thousands of years later. It is possible. Um, how, how we get there, there's a lot more science that needs to be done. Have you read Project Hail Mary? I have not. I, I have been recommended a million times. Uh, okay. Okay. I've been a bit busy with school lately, but you know, this coming break or some break, I'm very excited to read it. And I, Indie Wire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A follow up to The Martian and a little bit more right. sci-fi. I read it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've heard great things about it. As always, you know, the man does more than enough research on you know to make it really high fidelity science. Mark Watney went to University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> with all that you do, there's no time to read. Come on, right? <laughs> Yeah, you gotta keep up. I, I, I try, I try. Right, right. So med, med uh, school, I don't know if you've heard. Sometimes med school is a lot of work. Is it? I would think so. <laughs> Actually, yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, I, we do have a hand up. So let me try to get uh, Larry Ahern, our VP of chapters. Larry, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I just want to point out that I've been around, you know, this, this whole space thing for about for almost four years. And uh, and I will tell you, I've met a lot of these uh, Matter of fact, you, you brought like uh, 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 oh, Brad and uh, what you call it, uh, Pomeroy and, uh, and Diamandis. Uh, they were with NSS a long time ago, but uh, they're also, uh, they're, uh, I know uh, how to say this. There's a lot of people that I know were SEDS people, because SEDS have been coming around to NSS for, uh, matter of fact, a lot of SEDS people are, are NSS people. And I noticed uh, a lot of these people end up not going into space, but they're, they're doing a lot of things that are cutting edge, uh, cutting edge. They're nano, uh, some, uh, some of our people are nanotech researchers. Some of these people are, one guy's working in Taiwan. He's, he's excited about coming back to the United States because they're going to be moving, moving his uh, uh, semiconductor stuff back here. And, uh, and uh, so, he, uh, like I said, there's a lot of these people. I think there's, matter of fact, you guys should look it up. I, I was been told that there's uh, a, more than one person that's, uh, uh, in our in, uh, SEDS member and, and uh, served in the Congress. So I just, I mean, there's a diverse future. And the, when I talk to these people, when I see them later on in life, the first thing they talk about is they want to talk about space. They, they're gone everywhere but space, but they want to talk about space, even though their jobs are something totally different. So space is formative for these people. Very yeah, good, Larry. I mean, Thanks. Uh, that, that kind of leads to a, a, a question uh, for you. Uh, you know, there was a question there about uh, about space history, but uh, who have you met in, in the space community? It could be someone from our history, someone current that maybe has inspired you uh, in, in, you know, in saying, wow, this is why I want to be in this area. Uh, Audrey, I'll, I'll go with you. You looks like you're ready to answer. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. So I have a few people that I met prior to SEDS and a few that I met after. Um, one person who I always like to give a great shout out to because he's just been such an incredible voice um, and passive mentor in ways is Charlie Duke. I met him in high school at a couple different events, including the Apollo 11 50th gala in um, at uh, Kennedy, which was actually hosted by Christina Court, who will be speaking early next year. Um, but Charlie is an incredible, incredible human being, and I'm incredibly grateful to know him. A couple of the other people are uh, I've met and um, Dan Tani, who was a shuttle astronaut. Um, he's also fantastic. I did meet him through SEDS because he spoke at SGX. 
And oh. um, so we were able to go to satellite uh, due to our partnership with uh, uh, access access intelligence. Yeah. And so as a part of that, we were able to meet Dan, we were able to meet Alvin Drew, a couple people who uh, are really great friends of Sense. And Alvin will actually be speaking at Space Mission next year. Oh, not Alvin, uh, Dan. Alvin is speaking this year. Um, but yeah, let's see who else. Gosh, there's a lot of fantastic people. I mean, Will Pomerantz is fantastic. And then also at Satellite, briefly met Gwen Shotwell. That was amazing as well. Yes. Um, that was intimidating, but amazing. <laughs> kind of the person that I want to be when I grow up, I suppose. Right. But yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> there are a few names. Um, one in particular was the aforementioned Chris Lanehart, just a really genuinely great mentor that I met um, while at NASA. And like I said, he helped me get started in SEDS. And then has been a person as someone who, you know, doesn't have any family in medicine and is the first guy in my family to go to college, just like someone I could lean on and ask for lots of advice going through kind of all of the, the work I've done in, in space medical land. You know, there's not a lot of folks out there. But the other uh, person who I really appreciated talking to me was um, astronaut Johnny Kim. And just an incredibly ge generous and genuine human being that um, when I was an intern at NASA, um, he made time to, to meet with me and speak with me and just tell me a little bit about kind of making decisions to make med school even possible. Um, in, in a few places, his life actually parallels mine. And, and trust me, he, he lives a, a incredible life so you know just just like being in the in his presence was just very very um humbling and I just really appreciated a lot of the advice he was giving me at the time and so just you know there's just really cool mentors and, and space is a place for a lot of cool people I would say absolutely Sonny how about you certainly um I had um Many inspirational uh, figures. Uh, one uh, uh, one example would be uh, John McBride, um, Captain John McBride, um, also from West Virginia. Um, had the opportunity to meet with John um, while as an undergraduate uh, student, and and have, being able to communicate with someone that has um, uh, a connection from where you're from, um, and is also in the uh, community, uh, the the profession that you're interested in, um, is is. Uh, uh, makes it closer to home, so to speak. And then also in the context of um, how I, what drew me to space biology, um, the opportunity to uh, uh, speak with uh, and meet uh, with um, uh, Judy Hayes uh, from NASA John Space Center. Um, she was really the one that, um, uh, I had even discovered this uh, field even existed. Uh, and uh, where I, my originating uh, interests were um, in engineering, uh, but I had an interest in biology and medicine. So uh, that really sparked that um, uh, uh, reality uh, that uh, this is a discipline uh, within NASA that uh, existed. And what drew me to my um, uh, education post undergrad and where I am now today. Um, and it's, in ret retrospect, um, uh, a lot of serendipitous moments but highlighting what um, Dominic, Sarah, and Audrey had, uh, had shared, context of the people, the individuals one can interact with uh, from the space industry is, uh, uh, is, is always an interesting conversation, always exciting, uh, always a fascinating connection to make, um, and uh, leads to um, uh, some really uh, incredible uh, different directions. Very good. Well, everybody, we're, we're closing in on our uh, end time. So what I want to do now is just take a few minutes to talk a little bit about NSS uh, for the uh, said students, and then we'll come back and do a final question for everybody. And uh, so let me share my screen again, and we'll get that going. Okay, great. So I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, NSS and why it's important uh, to join NSS for students. But first, let me just congratulate all said students for being part of an organization that can serve to help advance your own interests at the same time uh, advancing, you know, as we say, humanity in a sense with your interest in space. So really when you're talking about National Space Society, 
uh, I'd like to say it's a path to shaping your future uh, and the future of space. So it's an opportunity to learn, uh, to share, you know, to also share information, to engage with space leaders and uh, participate and shape your career uh, and the future of space. You know, you're talking about people you've met. Uh, I can tell you that at my very first ISDC, which was the very first ISDC in 1982 here in Los Angeles, I had met a who's who of space people that I just had heard about through television and, and reading about them. And it's just an enormous way to, to get to know some of these individuals. When you're wondering about who we are from the standpoint of NSS, you know, we are a dynamic member-based community of space advocates, enthusiasts, and professionals with a goal of fostering the exploration and settlement of space. So we certainly align with the vision and mission of what SEDS is, but we take it a little further, obviously, as we start thinking about what we do in all the things that we have uh, a reach in. And I like to say it's, it's about the power of membership and participation. It isn't just being a member, it's what you do with that. It's how you, you, you engage, how you participate. And the more you put in, no matter what kind of organization you belong to, the more you're gonna get out of it. So in terms of NSS, I'd like to say one part of us is about knowledge. It's about staying up to date on the latest in space. That's about people, it's about technology, it's about programs. And you do that in a number of ways with our Ad Astra magazine, which is an award-winning space magazine. Uh, it comes out four times a year. And it is incredible what you can learn just from reading Ad Astra. Sarah mentioned the ISDC, our International Space Development Conference, our annual conference. Again, bringing together experts across a whole range of space and space technology. And we've got big things planned for the ISDC in Dallas, uh, or it's actually Frisco, just north of Dallas. Uh, and we're gonna really involve the said students. We've got a new, a new benefit, the New Space Journal. It's a, actually a journal for uh, entrepreneurs. It's a journal for what's happening in new space. Uh, it, this is a, this is a uh, uh, these are peer reviewed articles and you can access that uh, through our inside NSS website uh, for member portal, as I'll call it. We have things like our space forums like tonight, where we've, we've had a whole range of speakers about technology, about medicine, about psychology, uh, and so on. So all those things you can gain from being part of NSS. There are also the connections that we've just talked about, meeting colleagues and networking with space leaders uh, and other enthusiasts at our conferences and our summits. I'm currently at the Space Settlement Summit in Los Angeles, and it's amazing what you can learn from talking to some of these incredible people. There are chapters that we have that are locally geographically based where they put on activities and events related to space. And you can get a chance to meet local individuals who are interested. We've got a very active new social media presence as well uh, to get people informed what's happening in space. And finally, just again, a range of, of access to uh, all subject matter experts across a whole range of space issues. We also are involved in advocacy, you know, being part of shaping the conversation to promote a space vision and also to inspire the next generation of, uh, of space professionals. We have a political action network where we actually go and talk to members of Congress and senators uh, talking about what's important to the space community. I mentioned the space ambassadors. These are individuals who are experts in their area and go out talking to civic groups, students, uh, universities, and so on. And we have our Space Edge Academy, which is really a resource for teachers and students. Uh, and it's a really a STEM-focused uh, type of program uh, to get the next generation of space professionals. And finally, there's career development. It's a way to explore your career options, develop technical and leadership skills, 
that are going to separate you. Not that you, our panelists need that. They're pretty impressive as they are, but it's a way to, to really uh, uh, take it to the next level. We've just started an NSS Career Center. We've got a little bit more work to do with that, but we want to make sure it's a great resource for those who are looking for positions in, uh, in space. We have volunteer and leadership opportunities and our chapters at the society level. Uh, these are ways to develop the skills you're gonna to need to succeed. Technical ability to make technical presentations, contests and competitions to help build skills while you're still a student. All of these things are critical uh, to your advancement and not only your advancement, but what you can do to influence the space community. So I will say NSS is a great organization uh, I joined as a student back in 1977 when it was the National Space Institute. I was just starting out uh, in college. Uh, and for me, it has been an amazing uh, journey and experience. I definitely encourage uh, all said students to consider it. Uh, we'll be sending out some more information about that, but it is all of us. We're committed to creating that spacefaring civilization. And we say, why join NSS? because you can make a difference. So I thank you for the opportunity to make the short presentation here. Uh, and what I wanna do now is see if there are, you know, obviously we might get questions, there are a lot more we can do to, to actually follow up with all the students about joining. So, so uh, let's see, we're just at our, at our end time. Let me ask our panelists uh, one final question uh, before we adjourn for the evening. And I, sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, uh, but, you know, you're all interested in space, you're going on different paths, an industrial engineer, an astrophysicist, uh, a doctor, where do you each see yourselves in about 10 years? So Sarah, Sarah, how about we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned that what I love is money. And my jam is pricing, especially dynamic pricing. That's what I do right now in my role at Universal Orlando. What I wanna do in 10 years is do create the price for the tickets that people can buy to go to space. Sounds great. Audrey? This is the dreaded question that is always so fun for an undergraduate to answer. Oh, so for me, I think, it's more about the things that I want to have accomplished and that I want to develop. I want to develop greater my scientific communication roles. I would love to be finishing up or having recently finished uh, grad school. I'd love a PhD in astrophysics. And then I think it would be really interesting to be starting out a career working towards having a hand in the scientific goals and direction of missions and programs, particularly if those can be uh, crude programs as well. I think that that would be really, really fantastic. Um, but I mean, gosh, in 10 years, I'm going to be 30. So I think I'd still be like a vaguely young professional. I have some time to figure out some of that stuff, but you'll be 30. I, oh boy. You're it's all downhill from there, right? <laughs> oh no, I'm going to, 30 is going to be my decade, I think. I think that'll be it. Um, but yeah, I mean, someday, once I'm eligible in grad school, I intend to start hitting those astronaut candidate application buttons. At the very least, I can frame a rejection letter, but you miss all the shots you don't take. And that's kind of my philosophy. I really go where the wind takes me. Yeah. Before we go to Dominic, Sunny, do you want to give us your where will you be? <laughs> I uh, am happy where I am right now. In particular, would love to see how the students, young professionals, where they are in 10 years. My uh, aspiration is to always be a professor, uh, uh, recognizing how, as a first-generation academic, how uh, uh, it, the professors, the educators in my life uh, really influenced me in so many different ways. So I am, uh, more than anything, incredibly excited to see where the next generation of students, young professionals like Dominic, Sarah, and uh, and, uh, and Audrey, and, and many, many, many more, what uh, how they will uh, and uh, are going to contribute to the um, the incredibly exciting time you are in, uh, ongoing in the, in the space industry. Great. And I guess we close with Dominic. Happy to finish it up. So for me, um, med school and then residency could put me at about 10 years. Um, the, resi the residency program I'm thinking of is called interventional radiology. And it's a very new field of medicine. 
I saw an excited nod where imagine coupling the, you know, element of radiology where you're looking at pictures and then you're actually doing live um, minimally invasive surgical type procedures. So you can run wires and lines through people. And it's this really cool intersection where, you know, you're doing some surgical stuff while at the same time, you know, applying really good understanding of anatomy and imaging and, you know, kind of, un you're, it's one of the few specialties you can access the whole body. And hopefully during my third year in medical school, I'll work with NASA to maybe suggest that who's the uh, medical provider you want to send to space? Well, you might want to send an interventional radiologist, then do that residency. And then like Audrey, maybe that's time to hit the uh, submit button on this application. So <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, you know, maybe I'll be seeing her up there, you know, on the way to Mars, so. <laughs> Sounds great. The only thing I ask, if any of you do get a chance to go to space, uh, would you please invite me to the launch? Oh, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> so, yeah, you're in the very good. Very good. Well, thank you. I know we're a few minutes over. I know we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule there at Space Vision uh, to share some of your story and tell us a little bit more about SEDS. And thank you for the opportunity for me to present a little bit about NSS uh, and hopefully get some students inspired. So uh, we wish you uh, uh, most great success in, in first with your Space Vision Conference and then through the rest of your academic careers and as you get progress uh, into professionals. It's been a pleasure uh, to get to know you this evening. So I wanna thank you so much. Sunny, thank you as well. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, as always, I wanna thank my other colleagues, Larry Ahern, uh, and Fred Becker, and also uh, all with us tonight uh, from our from our education side is Francis Delutri, who is also at uh, uh, Space Vision. And I've got a colleague here with me, Ronnie. Why don't you say hello, Ronnie Lejoy uh, is here with me. There he goes, uh, uh, former VP of membership and chair of the membership committee. So everybody, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, for those of you in the new time zone, or tomorrow's time zone, wishing you a good day ahead. Uh, for those of you in the evening, wishing you a great evening and a great weekend ahead. Everybody stay safe. Thank you again. And we'll see you on December 8th. Everybody, wishing you a good night. Good night. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. And everybody? There.